This podcast is an extract from Modern Railway Working, Volume 2, published in 1914. And this concerns the organisation and duties of the goods department. And it's uh, Section 6, Chapter 1, Assistant and District Goods Managers. The railway accounts published by the Board of Trade show that the amount earned by 38 of the leading British railway companies for the conveyance of goods is more than £30 million, or over 50% of their total revenue. From this it is evident that the carriage of goods forms the most remunerative branch of the traffic department, and that the management of this section is a matter of premier importance. On most of our large railways, the control of the goods department is vested in the chief chief goods manager, an officer of the company who is subordinate only to the general manager and who takes entire charge of both the operating and commercial sections of the work. On railways which are worked on American principles, such as the Northeastern or the Great Northern, the organisation is somewhat different, but for the present we will confine ourselves to railways which are worked on the ordinary lines, such as the London and North Western Railway. On such railways, then, the goods manager deals in person with important staff appointments and with questions of principle, the routine work being left to subordinates. He usually has two assistants, one called the indoor assistant and the other the outdoor. The former deals with rates and charges, rebates, claims, railway clearinghouse questions and the numerous details which go to make up the commercial section whilst the latter deals with the movement of the traffic. The Assistant Goods Manager Indoor The Rates Office probably forms the most important department controlled by the indoor assistant. Every company has thousands of local rates of its own, in addition to the through and competitive rates which are common to several companies. Hundreds of new cases arise daily in the principal company's rates offices, and as large interests are often involved, it is essential that each case should be settled with extreme care. It must be understood that that for the purpose of fixing charges for railway conveyance, the goods liable to be carried have been classified by Parliament into eight divisions, the classification being partly based on on the value and partly on the nature of the commodity. Three of the classes are distinguished by letters, A, B and C, and the others by numbers, 1 to 5. Class A traffic is carried at the lowest rates and includes articles like coal, manure and minerals in their raw state, which are usually conveyed in the owner's own wagons. Classes B and C also apply to heavy traffic, which is carried in wagons belonging to the company, and which comprises iron and steel goods, flour and vegetables in large consignments. The goods in the lettered classes do not require to be carted by the railway company, and are accordingly carried at what are known as S2S, that is station to station rates, which do not include loading, unloading or carting. Classes 1 to 5 apply to general traffic, the rates on which become higher according to the value, bulk and fragile nature of the articles. Class 1, for instance, embraces ringing machine rollers, class 2, bales of yarn, class 3, stuff goods, class 4, jars of spirits, and class 5, furniture. These goods have, as a rule, to be collected and delivered at either end of their journey, and their rates are known as C and D, i.e. collected and delivered rates. These eight rates are, of course, fixed between every pair of stations, and with the help of the classification, it is a simple matter to determine the rate for any particular consignment. The bulk of the traffic is, however, carried at special rates, and these are the indoor, and these the indoor assistant has to determine. For instance, there may be a special lot of bricks for building purposes to be conveyed where the ordinary rate from the brick fields to the town is prohibitive, and in order to obtain uh, the traffic, it is necessary to quote a specially low rate which will secure the business and still leave a margin of profit to the company. If two companies can both carry between the same points, it is necessary to come to an agreement as to the special rate with the competing company. The rates between corresponding points must also be carefully considered, otherwise a firm of brickmakers in another town may set up a claim of undue preference, when it would probably be necessary to also reduce their rate, though it must not be supposed that as a matter of course a claim for undue preference would involve reduction of a rate. 
Then again, special rates are frequently to be put into force to foster some industry or to cultivate new channels of traffic, and all this requires considerable care. New articles are constantly coming forward which are not in the general classification, and these have to be classified. This is usually done by the goods managers or indoor assistants in conference at the railway clearing house and requires a good deal of technical as well as practical knowledge. The indoor assistant also looks after the trader's outstanding accounts and takes up cases where the local agents have failed to collect the amounts due to the company, which amounts are withheld owing to rates, disputes, claims or other causes. It is usual for, for the local agents to specially report all accounts which are not paid within a certain time, and thus automatically further pressure is brought to bear on the firms from headquarters. The numerous claims which are made for damage and lost goods also entail considerable work on the head office. It is necessary to inquire into the bona fides of each claim, the causes which result in claims being traced home, and steps taken to see that everything is done to prevent a recurrence. It is also necessary to see that claims are not improperly paid by want of care and supervision in the district offices. The Assistant Goods Manager Outdoor The outdoor goods manager is nominally responsible for the expeditious transit of the goods traffic, but although, as a matter of fact, he does control the formation of the trains and determines whether certain trains shall run or not, the officers of the superintendent's department are responsible for the actual running of the trains. This seeming anomaly arises from the fact that it is impossible to divide the control of trains which run over the same metals, and therefore it is only when the goods trains are actually in the goods yards that they are in the charge of the outdoor goods manager. As soon as they emerge onto the running lines, they fall under the control of the superintendent of the line whose department makes all the timetable and signalling arrangements. This is the normal and old established type of British railway organisation, but it undoubtedly contains anomaly which in recent years the North Eastern and Great Northern Railway companies have endeavoured to remove by devising a new redivision of the traffic department under the heads commercial and operating. Under this arrangement the department formerly known as that of the superintendent of the line is enlarged to embrace the control of the whole of the operations connected with the working of the trains, including the management of the goods stations. Under this organisation, the position of outdoor goods manager is abolished, the goods manager's department retaining only the work at the terminals, that is to say the duties not connected with the actual working of the trains. We might add that under the organisation just referred to, a chief traffic manager is appointed with supervision over both the operating, that's including passenger work, and commercial branches to give a unity to the whole traffic department. It is the duty of the outdoor goods manager to keep the goods train mileage, that is the total number of miles run by goods trains, as low as possible consistent with expeditious working of the traffic. One method adopted is to keep the average load per truck as high as possible and this is done by prohibiting loads under certain weights by loading goods to transit points and by generally exercising great care in the arrangement of the loads at the forwarding stations. In this connection each station is obliged to render a return to the outdoor goods manager of the average load per wagon during certain periods and in the event of this figure being unsatisfactory the goods agent is censured and special te steps taken to improve the average loading. Another method of reducing the goods train mileage is by running longer trains with more powerful engines and it is the duty of the outdoor goods manager so to so arrange traffic as to make it possible for this to be done. One of the principal items of expense in connection with a large goods depot or shunting yard is the time occupied by engines in shunting and the outdoor goods manager carefully watches this item and effects economies where possible by rearranging the work so as to reduce the time occupied in shunting. He also calls for returns from the goods depots and shunting yards of the delays to trains starting from or calling there. As late starts of goods trains are a fruitful source of delay to other trains, the cause of such delays has to be ascertained and remedied and probably the outdoor assistant may find it necessary to ask the superintendent to re-time certain trains. The outdoor goods manager deals with the complaints which are sometimes made by the public with regard to delay to traffic in transit 
and traces the journey of each particular consignment. If the goods have been loaded in a through wagon, he probably finds it has been delayed in some shunting yard, and this has to be remedied for the future. Or if it is a small consignment, which has been transshipped on from point to point, he arranges some more expeditious method of dealing with the next lot. Large articles of an awkward character, such as boilers, bulky machinery, etc., require special loading and careful handling when in transit, and it is usually inspectors from the outdoor goods manager's office who supervise the loading of these articles and accompany them on their journey. When one company's wagons remain behind a certain fixed period on the system of another company, they are subject to demurrage charges. That is, an amount debited to the detaining company by the owning company for the detention of the wagons. This may be caused either by the wagons being too long on hand at the goods depot or by delaying transit between the goods depot and the junction with the owning company's line. It is the duty of the outdoor goods manager to prevent these cases as far as possible as the charges are somewhat heavy, being three shillings per wagon per day or upwards with an additional charge for the sheet which is used to cover the goods loaded in the wagon. The outdoor goods manager is also responsible for the working of the transit wagons, the use of which has been greatly extended in recent years. There is also always a difficulty in dealing with traffic which passes between stations in such small lots as do not justify the use of a through wagon. One ton is the usual minimum load for a through wagon and smaller lots of merchandise are dispatched either in a road van or a transit wagon. By the road van system, the goods for a particular branch line or a series of stations on the same route are loaded in a van which is conveyed by a stopping goods train. A summary of the goods loaded in each van is made out on a road bill which is given to the guard of the train and he puts out the various consignments at their various destinations. Under the transship station system, miscellaneous goods, not necessarily for the same district, are loaded to a central point and as numerous similar wagons reach that point from other stations, it is possible to make up through wagons from these to several of the destinations. The remainder is then sent on to a farther tranship station or is loaded in a road van. These arrangements require considerable care as this economical method of handling must be arranged so as not to cause delay to the goods. District Goods Manager the district goods manager exercises over his own limited sphere the same functions as the chief goods manager, and his office is in a small way a replica of the head office. He, however, comes personally into contact with the various goods agents and recommends them to the chief goods manager for promotion. He also keeps in close touch with the principal traders in his district and attends to their requirements. In his office, claims, outstanding accounts, etc., which are not of sufficient importance for submission to the head office, are dealt with, whilst recommendations are submitted to the chief goods manager with regard to rates questions, and representations are made to the outdoor assistant goods manager respecting the provision of additional goods trains and accelerated services. The local guards' journals are usually dealt with in the district goods manager's office. These guards' journals are important documents and form the basis upon which it is conducted most of the work in connection with the running and loading of the trains. The guard of every train, whether goods or passenger, before leaving duty, makes out a journal or train report which constitutes a complete record of the working of the train. The chief information recorded on the journals is as follows. Date, train number from the working timetable, name of driver, engine number, times of arrival and departure at stations, all delays and how caused, number of vehicles attached or detached at each station. As the punctual working of the trains is of supreme importance, the delays shown on the guards' journals are fully investigated with a view to prevent their recurrence. The individual delays are investigated separately and dealt with on their merits. The delays are also dealt with collectively in the following somewhat ingenious method. The line is divided up into sections consisting of the stations and short pieces of line and the total delays to all trains for a month at each station or in each section of line are aggregated. The result of all this is that one can see at a glance where delays are most frequent and consequently where a shunting yard requires enlarging, a goods yard rearranging 
or where additional slow or relief lines are most urgently required. The district goods manager also seconds the efforts of the outdoor goods manager to reduce goods train mileage without interfering with the efficiency of the service. One of the methods which he adopts to attain this end is to endeavour to keep the wagons conveyed by each train up to their maximum number. The number of wagons which a train can take between, two, between any two points is of course determined by the gradients and the nature of the line between those points and other causes. Assuming that the maximum load between A and B is 25 wagons of a certain class, it is obviously an unprofitable trip if a train is run with 10 wagons. In order to prevent this unprofitable running, the total movement of traffic between various pairs of stations for a month is abstracted from the guard's journals, and the average load per train for the month thus ascertained. If, then, it transpires that the average number of wagons conveyed per train for that period between A and B is 15 wagons, steps are taken to reduce the number of tra trains between those points, as it is evident that too many trains are being run with a resultant loss to the company. The district goods managers of the various companies meet periodically and discuss matters of local interest, putting forward recommendations to their chief goods managers on matters of importance. They also attend conferences held locally under the auspices of the Railway Clearing House and settle matters which are not of sufficient importance to bring before the chief goods managers clearing house conference.